great pleasure uh, to be here at the Salsta Society uh, Symposium honoring uh, Clyde. Uh, my own career has been a bit of a Salsta Society uh, um, uh, journey uh, myself. I actually started off as a uh, uh, as a medical student doing work on the development of the midbrain, doing the Ramoni Cajal draw, drawings of cells and working with a guy named Pasco Rakis on looking at how the midbrain developed. And uh, went on into the pediatrics and uh, as Tom Boyce knows, uh, moved to uh, Oakland Children's Hospital, where I ran something called the Center for the Vulnerable Child, looking at children in foster care. And it was through that process that um, I remember going to Tom with uh, Bruce McEwen's article in Scientific American about psychoneuroimmunology and sort of saying, you know, these kids in foster care have very weird biologically aberrant trajectories that have to do with what's going on, and the stuff that McEwen's writing about makes a lot, a lot of sense. Uh, and I found myself putting Band-Aids on the boo-boos of kids in foster care. We got very good at taking care of them and doing the kind of infant mental health kinds of assessments and interventions. But I realized there weren't enough Band-Aids and enough people like myself to put Band-Aids that we had to move upstream. And um, I continued to move upstream and upstream uh, until I found my way to Clyde. Um, and I did that uh, partially through two mentors of mine. One was Phil Lee, who was at, uh, kind of the Fraser Mustard of the U.S., and the other was through Len Syme. And both of them said, you got to go meet this guy, Clyde Hertzman. And Len said, and the people that know Len, Len doesn't dish out faint praise. Um, Len says, you're going to meet few geniuses in your life, and he'll be one of them. And I, it, was, it was actually 10 years later that I actually met Clyde, and I was at a, a pediatric academic society meeting in Seattle, and my friend Barry Zuckerman, who was doing Reach Out and Read across the United States, and the other friend Frank Oberclade, we rented a car in Seattle and drove to Vancouver to meet, to meet Clyde. It was like, you know, our sort of Lord of the Ring journey quest, you know. <laughs> or it might have been more like the Disney Three Caballeros, but we headed across the border to meet the wizard, you know, and, and there he was, and he took us in and walked us around the park and, and, and showed us what he d did, and we were aw awed, and, and for the next 12 years, I worked with Clyde in, in, in various ways. And one of the ways that I think about Clyde um, is that he was really like a virtuoso musician, and his instrument was his brain, it was his mind, his ability actually to play with lots of people in many sit uh, set, uh, settings, and to really do riffs on what you would put something out and he would just take it, you know, he was like the yo-yo ma of human development in my mind. Uh, and I, the other thing that I also just really appreciated about him was his ability, you know, with social gradients to talk about the gradients and to recognize how important the concept was in terms of democratizing risk so that you weren't talking about the poor children, but you were looking at how all of us were on the gradient. And the, the, the slope of the gradient put us all together in a way that it changed the political discussion. So I, I feel like I owe a, a, a great deal of uh, both gratitude and debt to Clyde, and also for his integrity, not meaning his honesty, but his integrity in the, the way that he continued to unflaggingly sort of pursue the goal of equity and issues of, uh, of promoting children's welfare. Uh, and as opposed to many who I know that have a patina of outrage, his outrage was deep in terms of what motivated him. And he took a lot of risks, and that's, you know, I think also what defined his integrity. He wasn't always um, subject to the tyranny of the p-value or the tyranny of other kinds of things that often motivate ma many of us to lose, I think, our way. And I think that was a great inspiration for me. So I'm going to um, really rapidly go through and talk about how the health system needs to be changed and the opportunity for children to lead the way. I'm going to talk a bit about the health development of children, a little bit about life course development, which I think that in the health field that Clyde has added greatly to. And I'm going to talk about this 3.0 transformation framework that we're using in the United States now. And I'm going to, if I get time, I'll talk about how using complex system science and communities can actually be used to change things. 
Uh, so we need to be transforming our system. Our health is improving, uh, but we have very low performing health and healthcare systems with low quality, high cost, and poor outcomes. And that for sure in the US, I think it's the same case in Canada and, and the UK, although their costs are quite different. We have great inequalities of health and they're growing and that we have rapid, rapidly growing knowledge that we're not translating. And the, we've all seen these kinds of curves and what you see on the United States at the top is the picture of an enormously inefficient healthcare system. It costs more and has the worst outcomes. In fact, there was a recent IOM report on this, uh, why the US is the sickest of rich nations. Uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that in, whoops, that in the United States, as is in most of the world that where we're seeing these uh, increasing curves, is the number of people with chronic diseases is growing up at a very rapid rate. We need to realize the U.S. health economy is going to spend $2.7 trillion. Uh, uh, you know, we're talking about huge sums of money, bigger than most of the economies in the, in the world on health care. But it's being driven by this increase in chronic disease that is happening. And we know that there are various things happening to children in terms of chronic disease, and we know that the obesity epidemic is one of them. But when we actually look at what's going on in children, what we see is there are increased chronic health problems with 16 to 30 percent of children in the United States having chronic health problems at present. And it's not hemophilia, cancer, and congenital heart disease. What it is is the growing prevalence of mental health conditions with 22% of uh, ch children or adolescents have mental health conditions with impairments. A greater appreciation for the role of neurodevelopmental disorders is also very common. And lots of kids with comorbidities and what we need to recognize is ADHD, asthma, and obesity are increasing but they're actually related, you know, why they're going up. They're not separate diseases. And for the mental health, I think, is going to be the next obesity. What we're seeing is a rapidly increase in mental health. And what we know about it is developmentally, it's all happening between ages 10 and 24. The cumulative prevalence of, of mental health disorders goes up incredibly during that time period with great costs. And even though as, as people interested in health development, we talk about adolescence as a sensitive period of development, it's actually a critical period for the health care system because we're... Uh, accumulating so much risk that will play through for the rest of the life course, and I'll come to that. We're also seeing in the United States that the disability rates for children are going up. So in 1960, we had 2% of children that were classified as disabled. Now it's 8%, and the face of disability has changed. So in 1960, the disabled child was a little girl with, with crutches and braces on her leg who had polio. The, pit, the poster child for disability now is a child with autism. And so we've seen this massive change that's going on. And so what we know when looking at the epidemiology is that 48% of kids have severe disabilities. We have 12 to 16% of kids that are classified in the U.S. as having special health care needs by our Maternal Child Health Bureau and eligible for different kinds of services. But we have somewhere between 20 and 40% of kids that have behavioral, neuro, and developmental learning problems. And then we have about 50 to 60% of kids that are good enough. You know, uh, and I put good enough, you're laughing a bit, because how many people here have kids? And, you know, most of you. And you don't look at your own kids and say, oh, you're good enough, unless you have a teenager. <laughs> and, and, and we don't manage towards good enough. We're managed towards optimum health, and we want to know what percentage of our children are thriving. But when you look at this and when you start to realize that you have 40% of the children that are carrying a burden of morbidity that they're going to carry forward in their lives, it's a daunting task. And it's not about making incremental changes anymore. It's, not even, it's about making transformation in basic structures and, and how we're doing what we're doing. So... And what we know across the, uh, across the world from the UNICEF report that came out, this is the 2013 version, the United States is right at the bottom, uh, Canada is right there, and the UK is right above it. But we're all in the bottom half of the distribution, and there's a reason for that. And part of it has to do with our legacy of the Elizabethan poor laws and how we built those into our social structure. But that's another story. This is not quite as fast a thing as I thought. We also know that economic adversity affects child outcomes. Kids are born early. We know that they have worse physical, cognitive, emotional health. They're hospitalized more with more mental health problems, lower health trajectories. They carry this burden of their social status into adulthood. And we know more about how it's programmed into their biology, thanks to Clyde and others in this room who have been doing the research. 
We also know that when young children fall behind, everybody pays in terms of school failure, in terms of social relationships and the ability to form families, in terms of long-term costs and social dependency, in terms of decreased productivity and lifelong health problems. These are the quote, quote externalities that we're dealing with in terms of, uh, of uh, from a social standpoint. And what we know is also that these differences start early. This is the famous Hart and Ridgely studies that everybody's now looking at, even though they've been around for the last 20 years. There's a big thing now in the United States about the 30 million word gap. The White House has been doing 30 million word gap. And we actually thought the president was going to talk about the 30 million word gap because it's so hot right now. But, but what this is showing is that basically by, you know, uh, 16 months of age, you start to see the splaying in these trajectories and you see these big differences that are developing that are compound over time. A recent study in PLOS uh, 1 that came out last month from the brain scan study that was done on young children basically showed in looking at total gray matter over the first 36 months of age, you see that function and structure are related and you see that the brain scan and the actual total gray matter is the same thing that you're seeing in the uh, Hart and Ridgely studies. And the issue here is not that, you know, you have these kids on the lower trajectory with lower brain mass and lower functional status, but when you look in the United States, we have 48% of our young children below uh, the low income threshold for having that sort of resources that they need to thrive. So this isn't about a safety net that we have to create. We have to rebuild the bridges and the scaffolding for human development. It's a whole, it's a very different kind of issue. And as we know, looking at our uh, kids entering kindergarten, we have these huge so social gradients. And this is from our early childhood longitudinal birth cohort study. And you see these huge social gradients. And we have to v start figuring out, uh, again, courtesy of Clyde, how do we start shifting the curve? Not how, how do we bring up the tail of the curve, but how do we shift the whole curve? And really, where's the leverage point? Where are we going to have the maximum leverage to actually change things? So from Clyde, we know also uh, from this, I stole this from him, and uh, again, as a musician, sort of riff on it. You know, we know these things domino through the life course. We know that uh, when children don't do well early on, you see all these problems that take place, you know, in the first, second, second third, fourth, and in into old age. And I remember Clyde talking about how uh, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of early childhood. In, in essence, that these things are all connected. And so we have the situation in which we have an ideal trajectory for children. Our current practice gets us far lo lower than we should be, and we have this enormous missed opportunity. So where does this leave us? Well, conceptually where it leaves us is there's been a lot of progress for us to rethink what we're doing. And I, again, I'm talking as a, a physician and someone who works in the medical world and looks at that $2.7 trillion that's being sp spent in the wrong time in the wrong place. And I start to think about how have our, how's our thinking changed? And we, we've gone through several eras of healthcare, but what we started with was this sort of biomedical model that was formed out of germ theory, 1800s, you know, the ana uh, anatomical and pathological models. And it basically was a simple mechanistic linear view of what disease was about. And unfortunately, most of our medical schools are still largely uh, stuck there. And we know because of Framingham and the Alameda County studying the kind of work that Michael Marmot and Lynn Syme and others did and the kind of behavioral work that was done that we moved towards this biopsychosocial model when, uh, by the 1970s. And this is a hierarchical uh, dynamic systems model that looks at multiple uh, d determinants in a different way. But what's happened in the last 15 years through the lifespan chronic disease epidemiology, the, uh, the epigenetics neurodevelopment work, what we see now is a new model that's developing around life course health development. And this is actually an important paradigm and frame shift that's happening. And it's, this model's complex relational dynamic and developmental. So it functions and we have to think and it, it guides our science in a different way. And what I think is happening when you sort of connect this to what's happening on the basic science side, and you see the same kind of changes that have gone on, that what we're actually moving towards is this new integrated model of health development that's going to guide our science and, going to, and begin to bring public health and medicine together and begin to really reframe how we think about health and healthcare as we move forward. 
And what's interesting about this, and part of why I put this out, is that as this is coming together, you're starting to see work on the genome and gene networks and looking at, you know, Waddington's topography or epigenetic landscape. And I think part of why Clyde was so taken with mapping the social, uh, social genome or looking at social epigenetics is that he really understood deeply how the landscape of people's lives and the landscape of the epigenetic uh, uh, process were actually linked and was interested in sort of make, making those connections again. So from the life course health development, what we're seeing, and this comes out of a working group at NIH on uh, the health science, uh, life course health sciences group that's working on health measurement. The principles we've been, uh, we've been coming up with is that health is an emergent property of living systems, that health develops continuously over the lifespan, that health development is a complex, nonlinear process that results from person environmental interactions that are multidimensional, multidirectional, multilevel that health development is highly sensitive to the timing and social structuring of experience and environmental exposures, and this is what T Clyde and Tom and everybody was uh, working on, that evolution enables and constrains health development path pathways and plasticity in all kinds of important ways, that optimal health development promotes survival, enhances thriving, and protects against disease and that the cadence of human health development results from this synchronization and timing in molecular, physiological, cultural, and evolutionary processes, that the timing issues end up being very, very important. The clocks in the cells and the clocks in our lives are all connected. And so that we have these time-sensitive pathways, again, from Clyde, you know, that understands that toxic stress affects the epigenome and is affecting things in time-sensitive ways. We know that there are these tra trajectories of brain development looking at glucose metabolism and synaptic density, and we understand where the periods of rapid growth are. And we understand now, in very simplified terms, because we have to be able to take this to policymakers and boards of education and other people so that they can understand this, that kids can go into a delayed or disordered trajectory or an at-risk trajectory, and as I was talking about, we have probably 40 or 50 percent of our kids in these at-risk trajectories, and it has to do with poverty, lack of health services, and toxic stress. And if you're going to go on a higher trajectory, you need more protective factors. So from a very simplified way, is what public policy is about is how do, we, how do we decrease the number of risk factors and make sure that they don't have the impact that they're having and increase the number of protective factors in children's lives. And it's not just individual protect protective factors, but how do we build a social scaffolding that actually makes that part of what our uh, society does for our children? So how is the science informing policy as we move forward, and how do we translate this into the medical world, which is still mo largely biomedically focused? Well, there's another story to be told, and this is this 3.0 transformation framework. And this comes from Lester Breslow, who, who talked about how there were three eras of health care and three major transitions. The first era was focused on saving lives through acute care, emergency and rescue care, and public health safety. The second era focused largely on prolonging life and decreasing levels of disability through chronic disease management, and that's where we're at now. And the third era, which we're emerging into, will focus on optimizing health and well-being through more primary prevention, health promotion, and community-integrated delivery systems. So it looks something like this. From the 1850s or 1700s, depending on where you want to put it, you know, life expectancy in 1900 was about 47 years. It focused on infectious disease. The chip in the system, the operating logic, was the biomedical logic. We used short time frames because everything was acute, and the medical, we developed our medical care model, our hospitals and clinics developed during this first era. We developed our insurance-based financing mechanism, again, because we, they were insuring against the unexpected. And we used a, basically an industrial model of production. That's why most of our hospitals look like factories in terms of how they're organized. And the focus was on reducing death. When we go through the great epidemiologic transition that happens in the, the early part of the last century, we go from life expectancies of about 47 years to 68 years by the 1950s, and we enter the chronic disease era. And there's an inc 
increased focus on chronic disease. We now spend 75 percent of our health care dollars on chronic disease in our country and yours. And the model shifts to the biopsychosocial model because of Framingham and others. And we start to understand that these chronic diseases like heart disease are caused by what you eat, what you do, the kind of environments you live in. And so time frames have to increase because we're not managing short term, we're managing now over uh, months, years, and decades. And we move to a different kind of framework and our healthcare benefits change as well. It's no longer insurance, but we're paying in advance for the colonoscopies and the cholesterol screaming and all the rest of what we knew. And we're moving towards more corporate models of health care to organize health care in these corporate entities in the United States. We have something called Kaiser. We're going to see these accountable care organizations are, are forming to organize so you have better vertical integration of the production model. And the focus is on prolonging disability-free life. We're headed towards this third era where it's just going to increasingly focus on optimal health development because we now have most of the 70-year-olds, when you ask them about their health status, about 60 to 70 percent of them will say it's excellent or very good. So we've gotten to a place in life, in our history, that we can produce optimal health. And the model is now changing towards this life course health development model. This is going to be the new chip that's going to drive the health system forward. And it's going to focus on lifespan and generational kinds of issues. So when we talk about the epigenetic research that looking across generations, this is what it's going to inform. And we're going to move more towards network models of delivery of care and networks in communities in terms of how they'll be organized. So it's moving from this 1.0 system to this 2.0 system to the 3.0 system. Uh, the U.S. health system is about 1.8. Canada might be at 1.9. Uh, most of the European systems are about 2.2 in terms of what they're doing. And what, just to go back to this model, what we see is that basically we're moving from the first era to the second era to the third era. So this is how science informs policy that informs the way that we're moving forward. So just to how do we connect cells to society in a way that actually has a functional policy model that we can act, make actionable. And the reason it ends up being important is back to our trajectories. If you go into a low health trajectory or high health trajectory, we know most of the action is happening early on. So that's the pivot point. Right? That's where you're going to get the change in the trajectories in life. And we know when you go into an early uh, low health trajectory, by 55, you're obese, you have diabetes, you have heart disease, and you're depressed. And that's, and that's what your health care cost curve looks like. And that's where we're spending our money. If you went into a higher health trajectory and you spent more early on, we would have a very different looking cost curve. And the importance here is in the United States, we're spending all of our time, the entire rallying cry of our health reform is how do we bend the cost curve? How do we actually squeeze it down a little bit in the end? Which is a, is a fool's errand. You're never going to squeeze the cost curve very much at the end of life. What we really need to be thinking about is how do we move from 1.0 models and even the 2.0 models that are trying to work on chronic disease and prevent to how we move upstream, not just to the upstream social determinants, but to the developmental determinants of health towards 3.0 models because that's where we have the leverage. So we should be talking about how do we shift the health curve in order to shift the cost curve rather than thinking that we'll bend the cost curve. And this is taking hold in the U.S. Our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation has adopted this 3.0 framework, and they're using it now for state innovation models to sort of think about what does a 3.0 design of a health system look like? What do community accountable health systems working on population health start to look like as opposed to where we're at in this episodic non-integrated care that we uh, currently have? And how do we move forward? How do you design and move forward over a longer time horizon? And what are the social and political and other forces allow that to happen? So what we've been doing, and I'm going to try to go through the <clears throat> last third of my presentation in the next 30 seconds, uh, is that we have a transformation framework. So how do you start transforming the system? And I'm not going to go through all of these because I don't have time, but one way you start transforming is change the logic. So we go from a logic of the new operating system where you're developing capacities and realizing potential of the individuals 
you're optimizing the health of the population, you're dealing with the individual population and the community. It's a different kind of operating logic for what you actually build your system around. And that's what Clyde was interested in, okay? Clyde was interested in health trajectories. He was interested in how you start connecting things up. And he used the EDI as an anchor point for that. So the EDI allowed him to look at school readiness, which is health develop, health related quality of life of a five year old if you're in the healthcare world, right? It was a health development measure. And what the EDI does is it measures children uh, and it looks at all these domains in children in a comprehensive way and that you can look at and be done in 10, in 10 minutes or 12 minutes and you can get a census on kids in kindergarten and you all know about it, but when I saw this for the first time in 2002 when Magdalena Janus and Dan Offord brought these maps to LA for a meeting that we had of the four countries, England, the UK, and the US and Canada, for me it was like seeing one of these for the first time. You know, I went, gosh, where did you get that? I want one of those. Because you could see it was a game changer. You know, it you know, completely changed what you were doing. I remember calling Michael Marmot a, uh, several years ago, and I asked Michael, you keep talking about social inequalities. How the heck do you measure it? And he says, do you know this guy Clyde Hertzman? <laughs> he says, he's got the best. I said, yeah, do I know, you know. But, but we tried for about 10 years to bring this to the United States. Uh, the, our friends in Australia, Frank Oberclade, who was at the same meeting, only a few years later took it back to Australia. Australia right now does the EDI on the entire country, all, all 290,000 kindergarten kids, and every single county, every place is, is uh, measured. And the important part about this, again, a thing that I learned from Clyde, is what Clyde was doing is not dealing in data. What Clyde was doing is taking data and turning it into information, right? And information is a difference that makes a difference. Clyde was all about what makes a difference. And it's taking that, that data and turning it into inf information, as Gregory Bateson said, it's about the difference that makes a difference. But Clyde went one, one step further and he said, how do we take that information and turn it into currency? How do we make it so valuable that those maps, those EDI maps, are like $20 or $50 bills that become valuable in a public policy sphere that become valuable to a community because it tells them something about themselves and they can trade upon it and use it. And that's part of how we need to be thinking. How do we create new markets of social value that we can actually exchange and use? And it may take our data as researchers, not just as data that give us little micro information, but the kind of macro information that we need to make big kinds of change. So this is what we're doing in California and Orange County. I won't go into this because you know, I'm in the land of EDI, so, but it's just to show you that we're wannabes and we're moving this forward. Beauty of the EDI also is that it's great at measuring the social gradients. That's what Michael was telling me. If you want to measure social gradients, you're not going to find anything better. And this is what we're doing now in the United States. We have 40 sites across the United States that are measuring the EDI, and we're doing it in all kinds of places from you know, uh, New Orleans and uh, Detroit and various places, and it's all being used for different reasons. And what we're doing is we're trying to figure out how do we use this to actually make change? What do we do to make change? And so in any community you go into, you're gonna find lots of programs that have exist already because we have a whole legacy of creating childcare and mental health services, preschools and stuff. And if you're a low-income parent, Right? And you have both a social work degree and a, a degree in civil engineering, you're golden, right? Because with those two degrees, you'll be able to find all these things because, you know, that's, uh, that's the only way, because they weren't designed to be user friendly. Right? But what we've learned over time is it's not about the services, it's about the systems. And that we have to embrace the complexity of the problem we're doing, dealing with. It's human development and community development are complex problems. They're not simple problems. And they, they don't respond to mechanical solutions. We need to scale the change that's needed. And these big complex problems have to work at scale. You have to be thinking about working at scale, not on 150 kids in a little place and think that that's going to give you the answer. And, and the most important thing that I think I've learned from the complex systems work is that complex systems learn their way forward. 
So you have to have a learning system that turns the data into information and currency. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to progress. And so the person from education and health, social welfare, have to come together. They have to all be able to learn from each other, take it back, and continuously learn in a virtuous cycle that moves you forward. And you have to have data at the right level that you're working at. You can't use infant mortality or some other data in a community health center because it's not, it's not scaled right. And we haven't quite figured that out either. So if we're going to move things forward, we're using this model from, again, from complexity theory. In any community, you have lots of individual programs, doctors and nutrition programs and early childhood reading programs, and they're all trying to provide human development. You have complex levels of organizations and agencies at a community level, and then you have the county and city governments. But what this looks like, you have funding streams that connect at all the old silos that we know that exist, and they actually make the programs work the way the programs work. But this is like a big weather pattern. And you know, looking at Bruce's allostatic load complexity model, that's what the community looks like. That's why people's allostatic loads are going up, because they're living in this complex world where everything is like a pinball machine. You know? And so what, what we have is this weather pattern that's close to chaos. And the question is, if we're going to move forward, we have to get alignment at the governmental levels. You, and that's what happened with Sure Start in England when Blair and Brown moved in and, and Gordon Brown came in and the secretaries or the commissioners or whatever they're called of education, health, early childhood were all sitting there like this and said, we're not you know, going to give you our money or do anything. And Gordon Brown said, I'm the treasury and you're going to do what I say. And they got aligned. That's one way of alignment. But we have to figure out how we align things. How do you get community-based organizations, hospitals, clinics, different kinds of places serving children, how do they work as a network? And if we can do that, we can get alignment and we can get actually pathways that work for people. If, in fact, we want pathways for development and the scaffolding, we have to build it and design it and make it work that way. So you need a learning system to make that happen. And so we've been figuring out how do you build a learning system? How do you take all these programs, how do you align early childhood education, health, family support, how do you develop a common agenda and communicate about it? How do you have shared outcomes and accountability so I'm accountable to the health, to the education person, that we're all accountable to each other? How do you have a collaborative system improvement so you're all working together on the same kind of improvement system? The way that Toyota or, or any big corporation now works, the way they learn their way forward is they use a common system of learning. The way our universities have a common culture of learning. So how do you create a common culture of learning in a community? And how do you align the finances and policy? So uh, I'm over, but let me just tell you quickly about Magnolia Place. You've heard a lot about the Harlem Children's Zone in the United States, anything, every, everything it takes or whatever it takes to make things work you know, and 30 or 40 million dollars of hedge fund money and you can get things to, to move. Magnolia is a different kind of uh, entity in Los Angeles. An a group of people came together and said, rather than building a place that will take care of 400 or 500 kids in a boutique educare or some kind of place where we're going to provide everything in one place, how do we work at scale with 35,000 kids? And how do we make them thrive? And so there's six hubs. In the Magnolia area, it's, it's a five square mile part of Los Angeles, about 100,000 people, 35,000 kids. There's 71 partner organizations working together. There's 100 community groups, 500 black advocates that are being developed, and 14,000 families. And here are the EDI maps for the area. So we're measuring EDI in green, but what you're seeing is the, the vul vulnerability around communication on one of the EDI skills. And when then you're mapping, how often are parents reading to their kids? So we now have at a neighborhood level the outcome and the inputs in terms of what's going on. And it allows for a very different kind of discussion that takes place. So we're taking these results out to the community, and the community is actually working together and managing towards it. And this is the kind of thing that Clyde was moving forward in, in various communities in British Columbia. But what we've been doing is developing a whole set of 
instruments and tools to move this forward so that we can take collective action. So how do you take collective action? How do you leverage this forward? And this is just a bunch of community groups coming together and working on problems and doing what we are cycles of plan, do, study, act. They're trying to improve things as they move forward. So back to our model, part of what we're trying to do is develop a learning system. So we're developing mechanisms and ways of aligning things, integrating the network so that we can learn, creating, using analytics and data so that we can turn it into currency, and figuring out how we can have adaptive, flexible, high-performing service pathways. How do we actually construct that to move forward? So to end, Clyde was all about promoting equity from the start. Promoting uh, early child development is about uh, achieving greater social equity. Their early years provide an opportunity to invest in early childhood development. And we believe that this life course health development model that you can bring in the health sphere to restructure the $2.7 trillion in a different way is a way for us to begin to think big about how you get the leverage. That the conventional wisdom and current knowledge are at, not, at odds in terms of what we need to do. That disparities that begin early in life continue to tilt forward and compound over time that this 3.0 integrated framework starts to integrate time, life course, context, and actors and agents in a way, because that's what we're doing the research on, but we have to figure out how do we integrate this in a complex system. That we need to figure out how we leverage the arc of human development we, so we can optimize things. And we need to be really thinking about what the design principles and the leverage points and where we make things move. So that we can make the economic and human cost of not transforming our systems, the enormous disaster that they are, and move it in a different direction. Thanks very much.